Jacob's Ladder, probably the most famous or most common male genital grouping of piercings. Coming up next on Pros and Cons by a Piercer, Season 2, Episode number 42. So you might want to just stick around. For those who are new to the channel, first off, welcome to the channel. Hope you're enjoying the videos. Hope you're finding them helpful in making those critical piercing decisions that you may have. But you may not know who this handsome fellow here is. My name is Davo. I'm a professional body piercer and have been since 1994. I own and I operate the Axiom Body Piercing Studio located right here in Des Moines, Iowa, inside Skin Kitchen Tattoo. Before we get too far into this, I want to give you a little bit of a disclaimer. We are I'm going to be talking about a male genital piercing. If you're uncomfortable with that subject, or maybe you're not old enough to kind of learn about that, or you're looking for something tentilating and sexually stimulating, you're on the wrong video. Um, if you would like to watch videos about piercing, there are plenty of those on our channel that have nothing to do with genital piercings. Also, if you're looking for some titillating, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen here unless the sound of my soothing voice does that for you. So, what is a Jacob's Ladder? A Jacob's Ladder is a combination of three or more frenum piercings. Frenum piercings are done through the loose skin of the shaft of the penis, done uh, horizontally along the shaft. They can be done on the top. They can be done on the bottom. Usually with uh, ladders, it's usually considered a ladder if you have three or more of them. Uh, they can be done on either side, either top, bottom, sides. I've done them mostly top and bottom. Once, I did one on the side, and then we were supposed to do the other side, and I never saw the guy again. The earliest reference to this comes from the uh, Tanzanese People of Indonesia. The frenum was done below, below the gland. Uh, it appears with a brass ring. The fiction of the ring tends to simulate sex. It's mentioned first in a book called the, and I'm going to really murder the pronunciation of this. Are you ready, boys and girls? And if you think I've totally destroyed it, feel free to comment. Um, it'll be written down below in the show notes. But it's the Jinsha for Anthology. Anyway, um... Piercing Laura claims that this was a chastity piercing and they put large rings in it and there's no documented proof of that. It may or may not have happened. Who knows? It's one of those things where, yeah, the piercing did exist before modern piercing, but chances are it may have been used for that, but it probably hasn't been. Um, in modern times, this piercing came about from the BDSM, mostly gay leather scene. was a very popular piercing, and at some point, somebody went, hey, I want two of them. And then somebody else said, well, you got two of them. I want three. And then somebody else came along and said, you know, you got three. I want eight. So it just kind of progressed from there. It's a pretty common piercing um, as far as male genital piercings. Probably Freedoms are probably the second most popular and most people, when they do frenums, they rarely end up with just one of them. The interesting thing about Jacob's Ladder is where it came from. The term came from the Bible reference of Jacob building a ladder to heaven. So we'll let you do the math on that one and figure out why a genital piercing would be called that. I know there's various uh, male sex toys that are named the same way. They usually involve a group of rings kind of in the same way. Now it's time to move on to the things that got you here, the things you like, uh, pros, the advantages, uh, things to say, hey, I need some of that in my life. Starting with number one, increases sexual sensation. Um, in some cases, I, I always say that with these piercings is any genital piercing is it will probably make it different, but it may improve it, may not improve it, but it's probably not going to be diff or that much worse. And if you didn't have the skills in the first place, it's not going to really improve anything. Um, the idea of it may, because people find it exciting. Um, some people don't, we'll get to that in the cons too. But uh, the main purpose of this is for sexual gratification to improve uh, the feeling, the sensation. Number two, this is an extremely well-established piercing. It is not prone to rejection or migration. They can migrate a little bit, but not to the level where they will reject. Um, it's a common piercing. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people have healed this out without any issues. So it's one that you can get done and fairly certain if you take care of it properly, you're going to see very little problems and it's going to heal perfectly fine. 
Number three, can be done in different locations. As I mentioned earlier, it can be done on the top or the bottom. Usually that's the two choices. It can also be combined with hofta ladders where you could have a piercing that starts at the very top of the penis just below the glands, goes all the way down to a lorem, which is a low, uh, high, it's kind of right in the middle of the scrotum piercings in the uh, – in the frenums, and then go all the way down uh, with a, a series of scrotum piercings or hoftas, all the way down to a gish piercing at the base of the scrotum. So it's it's one of those piercings that can be added onto and done in different positions. It could also be done on the top um, or the side. Number four, you can get as many of these as you want if you have the room for it. Usually these are spaced out in between uh, five sixteenths of an inch and three eighths of an inch apart, um, up or down, so to speak. And if you have enough room, you can do multiple, meaning up to, I think the most I've ever done on somebody is about eight or nine. Right around that 10, it seems to be like the most maximum. Though there are clients that I've had in the past where we could probably have gone beyond that. And the last one, number five, easy to conceal. If you work in a profession or you uh, live in a very conservative part of the world, this is a piercing that you can have that unless you want people to know you have it, they will not know that you have it. Um, often you can do this piercing, and uh, unless you're intimate with that person or maybe a locker room kind of situation, nobody's going to need to know that you have it or is going to know that you have it. Before we move on to the cons and disadvantages, uh, if you like this video, give me a thumbs up. Let me know if you liked it because I like it when you like it. Also, if you haven't already, subscribe. Hit that notification bell so that you're notified every single time we post something. If you have something to add to the conversation, maybe you have these piercings and you'd like to share your experience or you have a question about them, please leave a comment. I try to answer them when I have time. Now it's time to move on to the cons, the disadvantages, the things that may make you go, uh-uh, not for me. That's not what I'm going to be doing with my life. Starting with number one, safe sex for six months. After this piercing is done, I generally suggest practicing safe sex, which means some type of latex barrier, for a minimum of six months. Uh, it doesn't matter if you've been with a pa partner for 25 years. We're more concerned about that hard metal through soft tissue causing tears and then having an exchange of bacteria and getting an infection. Number two, more acceptable to STDs even after the piercing is healed. Meaning, anytime you switch partners, you need to practice safe sex the way you're supposed to, which means latex barriers. Comes down to that, hard metal through soft tissue, rough activities normally, possible tear, exchange of bacteria, infection, even in a healed piercing. And if the person that you're partnering with has an STD, there's a higher likelihood that you can catch that. Number three, cannot sleep on the piercing. You want to sleep on your back or on your side. You're not sleep directly on these piercings during the healing period. After it heals, it may feel somewhat comfortable to sleep on them. That varies from person to person. Number four, your partner may not like it. This is a common problem with a lot of genital piercings is just some people, they either it doesn't feel good for them or they just don't like the idea of it. Now, this isn't because there's sharp edges, points, things they're going to pinch and et cetera. It's just one of those things. Some people don't like it, and your partner may ask you to remove the jewelry uh, during uh, intimate periods. Number five, bleeding. These piercings are not as much of a bleeder, but they can bleed anywhere from three to five days after they're initially done. Um, it's something you need to prepare for with things like uh, sanitary napkins or pads during that initial healing period. Before we move on to things you should look for in advance, uh, let's talk a little bit about our merch store. Uh, we have T-shirts. We have all kinds of different designs, etc. If you like swag and you like body art, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. This piercing, even though it's one, not one of the more difficult genital piercings to do, you do need to find a piercer that's well experienced, especially with doing this particular piercing. They need to understand the structure of the penis. They need to understand that they don't want to go too deep. They need to not go through the urethra or cause some other problems. Um, it's something you need to kind of search out and find somebody that understands how to do this, what the placement should be, and especially jewelry sizing. Because if it's too small, it can be extremely uncomfortable when you become aroused. The jewelry, sh 
The jewelry should be at least 12 gauge. Thinner than that, it can tear through the tissue a little bit easier. So 12 gauge is usually the thinnest that I suggest piercing with initially. It should be a barbell. Rings can you can use rings, but I wouldn't advise it. They tend to be probatic and cause issues. <coughs> The only time I would suggest using a ring on a frenum is, or a curved jewelry is if the friend, if it, the person is uncut or uncircumcised and you're doing it inside the foreskin, uh, just underneath the frenium tendon. Uh, in that case, something circular or curved, like a curved barbell, is kind of a better choice. But if it's just your traditional right against the shaft of the penis, you definitely want to start out with a barbell. Now, this can bleed for, as I mentioned earlier, or, Anywhere from five to six days, sometimes a week. Uh, usually three to five is a good assumption. You, most people, the first night, and that's about it. But it's a good idea to get those sanitary napkins or pads beforehand just to cut down um, on the likelihood of staining clothing. The other advantage of the pads is that it adds a little more cushioning. So if it does get bumped, it doesn't feel quite as bad. Cuts down the amount of moisture in the area, which cuts down the amount of bacteria, which is going to help fight off infection for that initial three, four days when you're most acceptable to it. Now, during the initial setup and everything else, they're going to have to, the piercer's going to need to uh, evaluate your anatomy. Um, they should make you feel comfortable, not creeped out, not feel weird about this. Um, most of us have a, a bedside manner about making sure that everything's very professional, very clinical, and making you feel comfortable. But you should kind of evaluate the person that you're talking to that you're going to have do this. And if they seem like they're very immature or kind of a little creepy, you might want to find a different piercer because you're going to be naked in front of this person. The next thing is it's going to feel uncomfortable for the first couple of weeks to have sex, even with a condom on and everything else. Uh, it's a good idea. If you have a steady partner that you discuss this piercing with them before you get it done, also you might want to have a little bit of extra activity before getting it done just to make everybody a little bit less uh, uh, demanding, I guess is a good way to put that. Last thing is, is aftercare. Uh, does your piercer provide aftercare product, in this case, uh, sterile saline spray? Um, if they don't provide it with the piercing, how much do they charge? Um, if they don't have it, where can you get it? Uh, also, they give you written instructions, verbal instructions, or possibly a video that explains how to take care of the piercing. Um, you got to keep in mind that you're going to have this piercing. It's going to take a few months for this to heal. It's a good idea to make sure that you have that support ahead of time, then find out afterwards when you start having issues or questions and the person is completely unavailable to you. Now let's move on to the piercing experience. First thing is going to be consultation, evaluation, and selection of the jewelry. Most common size with this would be a 12-gauge 5 8 or 3 quarter inch or in between the two. Uh, standard barbell, best in titanium if possible, or solid 14 carat. Stainless, in black grade, stainless steel is fine as long as you don't have a nickel allergy. Also, it should be internally threaded, not externally threaded. Uh, internal is a better is a sign of a better piece of jewelry. Plus, when you change that jewelry, you don't want that rough threading rubbing against that sensitive tissue. Next up, uh, you sign a waiver. Uh, uh, the setup is done. They disinfect the area. Then they're going to mark it. With ladders, uh, usually we'll start with the top and move, and move downward. Understand, you're going to have a little bit of shift in how those are going to look between when you're flaccid and when you're erect. The problem is we cannot pierce you when you're erect. It is not possible. It's going to be a whole, it'll be a bloodbath, I guess would be the nicest way to put it. So usually what we're trying to do is estimate what looks straight when you're flaccid. And in most cases, it works out well. As far as spacing between each one of them, it should be an even amount of spacing. Those dots should mark. On these, I usually suggest doing three at a time, tops. You get, you get further along in that, and you have an issue with the inflammation hitting and moving that placement a little bit, and also it's a lot for your body to handle at once. It's best to do three, heal it out, do another three, heal them out, and et cetera. This piercing I suggest being done with forceps, and the main reason is, is we want to pull that tissue away from all that stuff that's underneath it. We want to make sure that we just have that outer layer of tissue. This can be a bit uncomfortable, but it actually flattens out the tissue, which gives the needle a shorter distance to travel, which actually makes a piercing a little less painful. Piercing's done straight through. Um, usually with these, it's kind of an intense ouch. 
and then your endorphins and everything else kick in, and it's kind of gone. It's kind of, oh, God, that hurts, and then over. Jewelry is followed by, uh, follows the needle through, usually using an, a threaded insertion pin, so there's no separation between the needle and the jewelry. The jewelry is then closed. Any bleeding that may be occurring is stopped with uh, gauze and probably some saline solution, which the saline feels good because it's cold. Then, and what I generally do is I'll take the, have you take a look, of course, and see your wonderful new piercing, and you smile a lot and go, that's awesome. And then we take a gauze, put it in uh, the, the palm of our gloves, and then pull the glove back over the penis and then put a rubber band over it to kind of give you something to keep the, ble- the blood in place until you can get home or get some pads. Now, the piercing will probably be a little tender to the touch, and that'll last anywhere from three to five days. Varies from person to person. There may be a little bit of blue, bruising. Uh, that's usually caused by the forceps. Not a traumatic amount. Uh, the other thing you might see is a little bit of, uh, depending on what they use to mark it, like surgical marker. Surgical markers tend to kind of just, they go everywhere. Uh, they, they kind of, uh, and they'll stay for a day or two. Um, usually, it's not something you need to be concerned about. It's completely safe. Now let's talk about healing. Average healing time on these are 8 to 12 weeks um, or longer, during which time I'm going to suggest cleaning twice daily using a sterile saline. Also, I suggest rinsing it at the end of your shower under running water for about 30 seconds. Do not use Q-tips, cotton tip applicators, or anything else to scrape off crusties or any of that other stuff. Crusties, uh, limb discharge, the discharge that hardens collects on the, and deposits on the jewelry is normal. That's part of the healing process. Treat it like a scab. Let it fall off on its own. If you're constantly picking at it and agitating it, it's probably going to cause issues. Do not spin, rotate, or move the jewelry. Leave it alone and let it be. Cross-contamination prevention. Con- common sense stuff. Wash your hands before you handle it. No oral contact or exchanging of bodily fluids. Um, for the next six months, that means you use a latex barrier. With condoms, I generally suggest uh, try to find larger, looser condoms. Stay away from things that are ribbed or super tight. Uh, sometimes the large reservoir condoms will give you a little bit more room to fit that jewelry in there and make it a little more comfortable. No swimming. Do not swim. I don't care what it is. Uh, the only thing you'd ever want to submerge a healing piercing in is a clean and well-maintained bathtub. That's it. Nothing else. Keep pets away from it. Don't let them sleep in the bed with you. Keep your bedding clean or anything that may come in contact with the piercing, including clothing, etc. Avoid playing with the piercings and excessive movement. Sex when comfortable, gentle at first. If it hurts to do something, stop doing it, rest, and try again or try something else. Uh, Do not sleep on the piercing. Make sure you're sleeping on your side or your back. Normal reactions for the first three to five days is redness, discolorization, heat, tenderness of touch, inflammation. Um, all of those things are signs of, of the reaction that your body's having to the trauma of the piercing. Those will fade in time. It does not mean that you have an infection or allergic reaction. If anything else occurs or just doesn't seem right, always contact your piercer or physician. Bleeding, it can bleed anywhere from three to five days, sometimes a little bit longer, kind of spotty. Not really going to probably notice it in most cases. Jewelry. Leave the jewelry in at all times. Uh, You may need to downsize or adjust the size of the jewelry. That should be measured when you're erect. If you get erect and it's extremely loose, then you need something shorter. If it's snug and there's just a little bit of play, you're right on it. If it seems like it's painful or it's digging in, you need a longer piece of jewelry. Um, Just check it. Talk to your piercer and try to figure out the best size size that's going to work for you. Check the ends on these on a regular basis. Balls have a tendency to come unscrewed on their own, just rubbing against clothing, bedding. Um, If you're sexually active, of course, that's putting another uh, pressure point that could possibly unscrew that. Just check them at least once a week. Uh, They usually fall off at the worst possible time, and it's my experience with genital piercings. They usually fall off when you sit down on the toilet, so even if you could get that ball back, I don't think you necessarily want to put that next to the piercing, especially if it's just healing. Make sure that the jewelry has no sharp edges, points, or anything that is going to be uncomfortable if it comes to in contact with skin. Not only for yourself, but for your partner. Sharp edges are not going to feel good, is basically what I'm getting at. The best jewelry options with this is barbells, um, depending on the placement. If it's under the foreskin, possibly a circular barbell or a curved barbell or a ring may be a little more comfortable. 
Last thing on jewelry, uh, this is a mucous membrane. I do not suggest wearing silver. Silver, as it comes in contact with the skin, can erode and leak out what's called silver salts. Their body then absorbs it because it's a mucous membrane, and it can lead to silver poisoning, which is a discolorization, kind of turns it a grayish blue, and the only way to get rid of it is to have it surgically removed, the actual tissue. So no silver, nothing made of silver should be in that area of your body. Let's talk a little bit about living with the piercing. Jewelry, once again, should stay in at all times. Check the ends regularly. Uh, when switching partners, make sure that you practice safe sex, meaning latex barriers every single time you go from one partner to another until you've been properly tested. Lastly, let's talk about abandoning the piercing. If the piercing is still healing and there are any signs of infection, consult a doctor or your piercer before mo- removing the jewelry. If you take the jewelry out, there's a possibility of causing worse issues. The problem is, is how your body heals infections. It heals infections by pushing infected tissue and fluids out through the wound while replacing with healthy tissue below. The possibility is that if you remove the jewelry, the piercing holes both seal up, possibly trapping that infected tissue and fluids inside your body, creating, uh, then your body will isolate it by creating an abscess or a cyst, and then slowly try to push it to the surface again. It can be very painful, very uncomfortable, and will require medical attention. So if there's any signs of infection, do not just take the jewelry out. Consult your piercer or see your doctor before you remove it. If the piercing is healthy, either healing or after the healing period, if you remove the jewelry, it's going to slowly begin to close first in the center and then building outward. You're going to notice some scar tissue and possibly kind of a loop of tissue, it looks like, that where that jewelry used to be. These piercings kind of tend to heal outward. They're basically a surface-to-surface piercing, but they're one that actually works. Over time, these scars will begin to fade um, until it, it may not even be noticeable at all. A lot of times piercings will look open because it looks like both the holes are open, but the reality is is it's already sealed up in the center. Um, If you think you possibly still open, your best option is to go see, and you want to put jewelry back in, your best option is go see your piercer, have them try to put a taper pin through. That will generally tell them whether or not it's open or not. Lastly, uh, the piercings may discharge this stuff that kind of uh, looks like cream cheese and smells like dirty bum. What that is is sebums. Uh, it's a natural product. It's kind of a waxy oil that your body produces to make you watertight and also to uh, moisturize the skin and moisturize uh, hair follicles. With piercings, sometimes it'll collect inside these abandoned piercings or even current piercings with jewelry in them. Uh, nothing really special you need to do. It's not a sign of infection. It's not something you need to worry about. Just uh, cleaning the area with warm water and soap will usually get rid of it. Well, that's all I have to say about the most common Male genital piercing groupings, there is. Till next time, here's hoping your piercings heal with ease and without a single issue. And if you're in the Des Moines, Iowa area, I hope to see you for your body piercing needs in the future. Have a good day, everybody. Take care. Thank you for watching. And check out one of these other videos.